and welcome back to the Dreamcast. I am your host, Denise Walsh. I combine science, scripture, and stories that will inspire you to dive deep, break through your own personal glass ceiling, and design a life of your dreams. Welcome, welcome back to the Dreamcast. I am super excited for today's episode because I know that storytelling is a skill. It honestly is a skill that a lot of us need to learn, whether we want to build a business, build a brand, or really just want to be a better friend and connect well with others. Our next guest is a master storyteller and knows that how we tell our stories and how we connect with others is basically a skill set that helps us with everything that we do. His experience as a storyteller enriches all of his professional roles as well as his professional life. He has more than 40 years of experience as a stage, TV, and film actor. He has appeared in numerous feature films, including Academy Award-winning Moonstruck. He has worked in films with Harvey Cattell, Tim Allen, Richard Dreyfus, Christian Slater, Christopher Walken, Chaz, Paul Mentiri, Paul Servino, and others. Whew, awesome. More than 20 years ago, he began to teach the skills of dramatic communication to business people. And since 2007, he has helped numerous network marketers share their products, services, and opportunity through storytelling. I know this is a skill I'm excited to get better at, and I hope you are too. So please welcome Louis Bianco to the Dreamcast. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. I'm honored. And um, you and I are both network marketers, and that's another reason that I'm excited to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And I had the opportunity to be on your podcast, which is entitled Change Your Story, Change Your Life. And that is, you know, so resonant with me because we all know it. it comes to the story we're telling ourselves that ends up connecting with the life that we create. But I know that throughout the years, being an actor, connecting in, in the stage and film world, you've learned how to connect with the audience, but then you brought it into business. So tell me a little bit about your story and how you discovered the art of storytelling. I would love to. And um, to do that, do I have your permission to take you on a little fantasy journey? Absolutely. Denise, do you like going to the beach? I love it. Wonderful. So right now, I want you to imagine, and it'd be a great time to imagine it because we're both living someplace where there's ice storms, that we're going to the beach. And it's a big, big beach. It happens to be actually in Bronx, New York. People go, there's a beach in the Bronx? Yep, there's several. It's a gorgeous hot day. And you're walking with me. And as we're walking along on the boardwalk, we see a group of really cool-looking young men. They're all really physically fit. They're all dressed the same way. They're wearing the same kind of bathing suit, the same color. It's black with a little red piping on it. And they're wearing these cutaway T-shirts, so their arms are fully exposed. And... On the T-shirt in the front, there's a logo of a small devil with a pitchfork in one hand and a baby bottle in the other. And on the back of their T-shirts, we see the letters, Young Sinners. I'm a teenager at the time, and I look at them and I go, wow, aren't they cool? I'd like to be like them. Then I walk down onto the sand. You're coming along with me. We get down toward the water. And these guys have gone to another spot right near the edge of the water. We're relaxing in the sun. We're laughing. And all of a sudden, we hear a scream. And we look down toward the edge of the water. We see a crowd gathering. You and I get up and we walk close enough to see that there's a young man sitting in the water and there's blood oozing out of his leg. He has a broken beer bottle, has been stuck into his leg first, 
the attacker broke the bottle on his head and then stuck the um, shard of glass into his leg. The attacker was a young sinner. The guy who was hurt belonged to a rival gang called the Fordham Baldies. A week later, a bus arrives letting people off to go to the beach, and a young sinner was waiting. He thought that the perpetrator was going to be on that bus, and he had fashioned out of a 22 rifle that he recreated in his shop class in high school. He created an automatic firing gun, and he shot somebody that he said in his mind was the assailant and killed him. The guy was an innocent bystander. This was on the front page of the Daily News. So that's the world that I grew up in. And there were two important things in that story. I was really attracted to the mystique of the bad guy, of the rebel. And I was terrified of these people. You see, I looked like a really tough kid on the outside, but on the inside, I wanted nothing to do with violence. I loved the imagination, the arts, books, learning, nothing to do with the world of the gangs, but I had to live in their world and survive. Every day when I went to school, I had to pass through territory dominated by gang members, and I had to deal with them. And it was really scary. And here's what I discovered one day. When any of these guys came up to me and they wanted to test me or intimidate me, I had the ability to get them to laugh, to like me, and to listen to my stories. I was able to entertain them. And when I discovered that, it sent a signal into me, this is going to be your survival skill. It's going to be your way of getting on in the world and probably going to be the way that you eventually live your whole life. Cut to the time when I eventually became a professional actor, therefore a professional storyteller. I became a teacher. I became a writer all forms of storytelling. But I believe it started on the streets of the Bronx to save my own life. Wow, absolutely. Storytelling saved you because it allowed you to connect to a group of people that you might not otherwise connect to. Exactly. And I would like to add something here for your listeners. Notice the way I answered Denise's question. I did it by telling her a story. And I did it by drawing her in right away. Probably drew a lot of you in as well. I could have just told her a bunch of facts. I could have said, you know, Denise, yeah, I, I got into storytelling because, uh, well, uh, it helped me to... Um, uh, deal with tough guys in my neighborhood. And, um, you know, I, then I discovered that I was really good at it in school. And, you know, I took an acting class. Th those facts are not engaging in and of themselves. But when I put them into the context of a real story, they have a much greater meaning. And I guarantee you, you'll remember the story. I'll remember it because I was picturing it. Not only did you just say there was a beach, but you told me where it was and what it looked like and how you felt there. And you used descriptive words. Is that important? Totally, totally, totally important. That's a mistake that people often make is that they communicate, especially when they're selling, with facts and data only. And stories sell facts often repel. Ooh. Now, you were living in a world of storytelling and, and connecting with the audience, but then you connected it to business. Tell me how that works. Well, it was very interesting, actually. I was teaching 
an on-camera acting course in Toronto. And I had diverse students in there. Some were already actors. Some were students who had just gotten out of school and intended to become professional actors. Others were adults who had a love for acting and said, I want to explore this first as a hobby and maybe get into it more seriously. One of my students was a businessman. And he loved the course. And one day he came up to me, he said, Lewis, everything you're teaching us, the business people I work with really need. I said, really? He said, yeah. Because what you're teaching us will help them to be confident in front of an audience. It will help them to deliver their presentations in a way that engages people, et cetera, et cetera. So when he planted that seed, I began to do some research. And I put together a course based on the principles of dramatic communication that I was teaching actors using language that made sense to business people. I created a company called Presenters, and I began to teach groups of them and one-on-one -on -one coaching. It was tremendously satisfying for me and very rewarding for them because they began to get much better results. I did seminars for people in the financial services world where their biggest sin is to drown people in boring data. And the irony about that is, if you're a financial planner, you have all of the raw material in your arsenal to sell a dream to people and to move their emotions powerfully. Because when you paint a picture for a person, that says, right now, the way you're heading financially, you may be living in a rooming house in 10 years with a subsidized income and eating off of food stamps, as opposed to retiring in Costa Rica and being able to give your family a beautiful lifestyle until you're no longer here. That's what they were selling. Instead of, let me show you this financial tool that I has these statistics attached to it and blah, 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 blah. The person didn't wake up that morning and say, you know what's missing in my life? A statistical chart. If I had a great statistical chart, I'd sleep better tonight. No. They didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, even in just that example, you like I pictured subsidized housing or feeling like, you know, you're living in a cardboard box and certainly not living your dream life versus the opposite, which is living on a beach and, you know, enjoying refreshments or whatever the case may be. But we have the power when we're telling our story to really take people on a journey. And I have to say, I received a ebook from Lewis and it's something you guys are going to have the opportunity to download as well. And I used it on a training call with our team and everybody fell in love and then they started using it and it helped them build their business. So Lewis, I'd love to hear what are some storytelling like this like tips or secrets or like what what makes a good story okay right now i'm just going to list them because to um elaborate on all of them well we would need about four or five hours or more <laughs> <laughs> but here's what you want to think about no matter what you're selling you are really not selling that thing if it's a product or a service you're selling the result that that thing is going to have in a person's life. And these are the, the, the points you should be ticking off. You relate your story in an authentic fashion. People will pick up on hype in an instant because we live in a very sophisticated, media-savvy world. If you're coming across with a lot of jargon and stuff that sounds canned and memorized, people will feel it and they're going to shut down. So authenticity. You should learn to make your communication mysterious. 
Really? What does that mean? Let's use the word curiosity. And I'm going to give you some real specific tools in a few minutes for how to immediately put curiosity into all your communication. Curiosity is a hook. All of the media channels do it, TV, radio, whatever. They hook you first, grab your attention, and then they take you on a journey. You must use language that's vivid. Denise keeps coming back and saying, gee, I could see that. We're going to talk about using every one of the senses when you talk to people. You see, when you only use data, you're speaking head language. It's conceptual. It doesn't touch the emotions. It only touches the brain. People do not buy with their brains. They buy with their hearts. You get to their hearts by speaking in language that uses all of the senses. There should be conflict in your storytelling. I'm not going to explain that now. It will become clear after. There should be one clear message, not two or three or four or five. I'm a network marketer, so are you guys. Here's the thing. You're in love with your products, and that is the blessing. Here's the thing. You're in love with your products, and that's the curse. Because when you're beginning, you're going to want to tell everything about your products to your prospect. You're going to gush all over them. Every single benefit. Make sure you don't leave out a good ingredient or a scientific study. But the more you do that, the more you lose them. You want to choose one overriding benefit that your product or service is going to deliver to that person that you know that person is hungry for. The data will come later. And your stories should have a definable beginning, middle, and an end. Those are the tips. Awesome. I love that. I took some notes. I love one benefit, really thinking, all right, what are the benefits of my, my product, my service? What can, what is an outcome that somebody will get, but then only choosing one and crafting a story around that. So does that mean that we may have more than one story depending on the benefit? Absolutely. Uh, I know that most of our companies offer uh, appeal to different demographics. So if you're talking to someone and you know, let's say that their challenge, health challenge, and uh, you are in health and wellness, correct? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Let's say that particular person's health challenge is they never have enough energy to get through the day. And by noon, they're eating junk food. They're stuffing themselves with sugar. They're drinking enormous amounts of coffee and other caffeinated drinks. And then they're crashing an hour or two later. Everything you talk to them about is painting a picture of what their life will be like when their body and minds are surging with natural energy. Very simple example. So Mary, right now, by 11 in the morning, you feel like you're dragging a heavy weight through on your shoulders for the rest of the day. All you want to do is lay your head down on a desk or a table and go to sleep, but you can't. And it's an agony to get to five o'clock. Now I want you to imagine that by two in the afternoon, you're full of bubbly energy, as much energy as you had when you jumped out of bed in the morning without an alarm clock. You've got a smile on your face. You've talked to 35 people about your opportunity. And when you get home and your kids greet you at the door, you have all of the time, energy, and desire to play with them and be a fantastic mom. You can feel that. You can feel it. And, and I think at the end of the day, we want our listeners to say, oh, me too. Like, oh, I want that. Exactly. 
Awesome. So think about your product, your service, uh, your whatever you're offering, right? And think of a list, create a list of benefits. And then we want to think of a story for each benefit. So whether you're posting on Facebook or you're talking to somebody out in the marketplace and they start bringing up a struggle that they're experiencing, you have a go-to story that will connect with them in that, in that way. Now, you said beginning, middle, and end. Can you tell me a little bit about what the beginning, middle, and end should look like? Sure. Basically, I want you to think of all of your stories, whether they're 30-second stories, five-minute stories, one-hour presentations, or a longer presentation that you're doing in front of a large audience on the stage. I want you to think of them as movies. They're movies. You all go to the movies, I assume, most of you enjoy some kind of movie. Movies that engage us involve a central character that begins with some kind of problem or challenge in his or her life, in the course of the movie, runs up against many obstacles. Some of the obstacles seem insurmountable, and then finds solutions to conquer the problems and become victorious. You want to think of every story you're telling with your prospect, your audience is the central character, not you, not your company, not your products, not your opportunity. It's the person you're talking to. You've identified the problem they're having. You're going to paint a picture for them to make them feel the pain of that problem. You're going to really make them see, hear, smell, and feel the obstacles that they hit every time they try to overcome that problem. You're going to introduce your product or service as the solution, and then you're going to paint a picture for them of the transformation that they undergo as they begin to enjoy that solution, and that brings them to the conclusion or the end of the journey. Does that make sense? Oh my gosh, mic drop. Yes. And I think that one of the things I hear you saying is that it's about the audience member. It's about the prospect. It's about others. And so when I think of even crafting Facebook posts, so many times we say, I, and we make it about us when really our mission should be to connect with somebody else. So should we have our own personal stories that we then share or should we make it more general and just have some, uh, some key stories of friends, family? Like, what, do you, what do you think we should do in terms of crafting our own story? Should they be ours or should they be really about something a bit more general? You should definitely have your own personal story. But here again, you remember the intention of your story. It's not to impress people with how amazing you are. It's to impress upon them how your journey is very similar to theirs and how you went from bad to good to great. So that although you are talking about what happened to you, you're doing it in the context of what you know they want to happen to them. So if I was a person who used to struggle with energy and I used to hurt my body by eating junk food to get energy and drinking Coca-Cola, which would basically, you know, um, like pouring acid into my system and burning my whole body out. If I was that kind of person and I hated it, I can describe what I felt like at the time, then mention, but then I discovered whatever it was, my life now changed and paint a picture of the happy, energetic, productive, and enriched human being that I've become. So that by telling my story, they're seeing themselves in my eyes. Isn't that what you do when you go to a movie? Look, 
one of the greatest examples of all time was Sylvester Stallone's Rocky, Rocky One. Why did it appeal to so many people? You had an underdog, a guy who was lovable and charming, but broke, unknown, down on his luck. He loved prize fighting. He gets a chance to fight a world champion. He does, and he becomes a hero. Everyone sees themselves. I don't care if you're a woman, you're going to see yourself in that story. Because you want to be a heroine, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I hear you saying a few things. You're telling your own story. So we can maybe use the word I. It's not that big of a deal if we don't. But uh, the biggest thing is to say it with the meaning of not to be woe is me and look at me, I'm awesome, but with the idea that you can do. And I'm sharing you my story because I want to offer you the same, the same victory, the same solution. So you have the one benefit in mind and it tailors throughout the whole thing. Exactly. Look, I'll give you a specific example from my, my own life. I mean, uh, my company is health and wellness. Uh, from a product standpoint, one of the things that people love is uh, dramatic, safe, weight loss. Well, I have a weight loss story, but that's not the story that I'm going to emphasize if I'm talking to an athlete who wants to get more ripped and win a competition. It's certainly not the story I'm going to emphasize if I'm talking to a person who hates their job and wants to have much more money at the end of the month rather than much more month at the end of the money. I'm going to tell that person my financial freedom story, which I also have. And so I'm telling the story that the person I'm speaking to needs to hear most so that they can identify with that story. Now, if I may, you mentioned before benefits, and there's an important thing. I'm going to give you guys an unfair advantage here. Most people will either, if they're really not good at the story game, they're going to talk in terms of features, not benefits. What are features? Our shakes are made with undenatured whey protein. Great. It's exactly what I thought that, you know, that, that my prospect this morning woke up and said, my life sucks. What's missing? <gasps> I know. Undenatured whey protein from happy cows. <laughs> no, that's feature. Benefit. Mary, if you begin to use our superfoods, you'll experience, you'll enjoy dramatic, safe, probably permanent weight loss. Benefit. Now, let's take it a step further. Think in terms of the benefit of the benefit. What? Simple. Ask yourself, if this is the benefit, why does this particular person really, really want that benefit? Remember, not everyone who wants to lose weight wants to lose it for the same reasons. Maybe somebody feels that losing weight will give them a better energy to play with their children. Another person thinks, if I lose weight, I'm going to be in a position to look better on my job and get higher promotions. Another person could have a totally different reason. So let's say I'm talking to Mary and she has told me, I need to lose 30 pounds. And I say, well, by how long? When do you want to lose it? Then 45 days. Why 45 days, Mary? Because I'm going to my son's wedding. I want to wear this black dress that I've gotten. Quite frankly, I can't even squeeze into it. I would rip it to shreds if I tried to put it on. So now when I'm talking to her about my superfoods, I'm going to paint the picture. I'll say, Mary, I just want you to imagine what you're going to feel like. When you walk into the wedding reception, all heads turn. 
people are amazed at how wonderful you look and they tell you that. And then you see the big smile on your son's face because he's so proud of his mother who looks so beautiful in that black dress that right now only fits on a hanger. What I hear you saying, too, is you're casting vision. I mean, when we talk about casting vision for ourselves, maybe even casting vision for our team, you're also painting a clear picture for our prospects of what life will look like after they've used our product or experienced the opportunity. You know, you're, we're, we're in the storytelling business. I've never thought about it like that, but that's half our job is to cast vision for others. And the better we do that, the more descriptive it is, the more it connects with their emotion, the more they're going to say yes to us. Absolutely. Uh, not only that, you're going to make better relationships. You're going to have more fun. People are going to like you more. They're not going to run from you. Oh, no, there's that network marketer coming. They're going to corral me and they're going to try to stuff me into that thing. <laughs> well, the, and, mark of the, the mark of the vampire. <laughs> and you said, too, that storytelling made you likable to people that might not have connected with you otherwise. Oh, totally. I won the tough guys in my neighborhood. Those guys liked me. They used to love to talk to me. In fact, I used to often get the feedback from some of those guys. You know, one of the reasons they liked me, they said, you know what? You really have a kind of school smarts, but you also have a kind of street savvy to you. And they just love that. You know, if I was just the nerd with the school smarts, I would have been an object of, well, derision. They could have poked fun at me, a punching bag. Uh, and I wasn't going to come across as the guy with only the street smarts. Anyway, that wasn't unique enough because that's what they had, that most of them were not school smart. But I showed them both sides. But enough about me. I want to go back to some important storytelling points to help your um, listeners to make this really specific and concrete. Remember I mentioned conflict before? Absolutely. I, I was just going to ask it. about that. Yeah, let's, well, let's hear it. Well, I already did when I saw, spoke about beginning, middle, and end. Because if we're going on a journey, the hero's journey, there's always a before and an after. The before, the hero is facing a problem that they don't know how to solve. They're going to run up against obstacles, and those obstacles are going to create conflict. And then when you introduce the solution, you're going to resolve the conflict and bring relief and pleasure and joy, and that's where the conflict comes in. I love to use this example from a movie that everybody knows. Remember E.T.? Of course. Okay. Remember when I said there has to be one driving thing in your story? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Can you tell me in about two or three words, what was the problem uh, that E.T. Wanted to, needed to solve, and it was something that he really, 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 really desired and wanted? E.T. wanted to go home. You got it! To <laughs> go, to <laughs> go home. Yeah. Okay. Now I want you to imagine that the kids he meets are super geniuses. And within a day, they build the perfect spaceship for E.T., put them in it, and send them home. No conflict, no story, no movie. I want my money back. Mm -hmm. Who wants to watch that? No, what we want to watch is the possibility of E.T. never getting home. The, the possibility that he's going to be captured by the people who are chasing him, the possibility that these kids, as much as they want to help him, are going to fail. And all of those obstacles are introduced at significant times during the story, and then there's a solution. We breathe a sigh of relief, and E.T. gets to go home. So that's exactly the kind of story that you want to fashion in all of your selling, in all of your prospecting. 
practice, practice, practice. Listen, guys, you want to have fun learning this? Just see a lot of more, lot more movies. Here's what I want you to look for. I'm going to give you a tool right now. In fact, two tools that you can use right after this call and it will work immediately. How's that sound? Sounds good to me. Okay. There's a brilliant screenwriting teacher. His name is Sid Field. And that's S-Y-D, Field. In his book on screenwriting, one of his books on screenwriting, he introduces this concept he calls, he says, if you want to write a great scene, you come in late and you get out early. Huh? Sounds weird, doesn't it? You would think I'm supposed to come in early and then leave late. No, no. You come in late and you get out early. Here's what it means. You begin a scene at the height of the conflict, not explaining to the audience, you know, once upon a time, there was this um, creature from outer space. And you know, when he used to live on his planet, he had such a happy life. And then you'd go on and you'd describe what his life. No, 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 no. You thrust the audience into the middle of the conflict, which is spacecraft makes this landing and can't move now. Uh-oh, character's trapped. Then you build and build the tension, what's going to happen, what's going to happen, what's going to happen. And in screenwriting, you leave early means you don't resolve the scene. You jump to another scene. And now the person goes, huh, oh, my God, I got to hang around to find out what's going to happen. Eventually, you're going to resolve that for them. So how does that apply to you? Don't worry about getting out early. But here's what you want to start doing. Arousing curiosity immediately. Example. I'm going to be teaching a course on self-defense. Louis DiBianco would not be teaching that course because he's not an expert in it. But let's say I was. And I know something about self-defense. I can begin by talking to my prospect and saying stuff that's data-driven, like, let me tell you about the six interesting modules in my self-defense course. And at the first, in the first uh, session, you're going to learn the reasons why and blah, 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 blah. No. Here's how I would begin late or arouse curiosity. They say to me, Lewis, how did you discover the need for learning self-defense on the street? And my answer is, well, I knew I should have listened to my guts that late night when I decided to take a shortcut down a dark alley on my way home. And my gut was saying, don't do it. Thrusted me right into the struggle, right? Into the conflict. Because now you have to be asking what happened in the alley that night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just like when you asked me at the beginning, how did you learn about storytelling? And I said, let's take a walk to the beach. And all of a sudden, people don't know why, but I'm introducing them to a a group of cool guys, well-built wearing these designer bathing suits. Where are we going? It's going to see you hook the mind. So how? what are the things you can do? Open with a question. Great technique for arousing curiosity. Now, guys, it had better not be a yes or no question. <laughs> that is not a curiosity um, hook. That's going to kill you. You know, you don't ask somebody, (laughs) um, would you like to use supplements to lose weight? (laughs) 
as if they say no, not in, not on your life. Okay, good. They've answered your question. <laughs> but if I you ask that. them, you know, but if you ask them, how would people treat you differently the day that you are proud about the way you look? Right. Okay. You're- you're, you're creating curiosity and you're painting a picture in their own mind. And people connect with the struggle. They connect with the struggle because, you know, we could spend all day talking about the victory, talking about the solution, talking about the success, but most people connect with the struggle. So starting there takes them on a journey rather than saying, like the op- alternative is that they say, well, good for you. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, here's another one that network marketers stumble on. How do I present my opportunity, my business? People don't want to build a business. No, they don't. If you're telling them they're going to build a business, they say, I, uh, are you crazy? I don't have energy at the end of the day to even concentrate on a dumb television show. You want me to build a business? Get out of here. No. What are they trying to solve? Well, different people, different things. So what if you're talking to a person who is facing having to take care of aging parents who are probably on the brink of becoming very ill? Well, imagine this, Joanne, that if, God forbid, you needed to take Six months off to just be with your mother and give her comfort and care during the most important moments at the end of her life. But you had to go to your boss and get permission. And you knew they were going to say no. If you go away for six months, find another job. How would that make you feel? And what would it mean to your mother? Now I want you to imagine that if that moment ever comes, you'll be in a position to not only spend time with your mother, but to maybe take her on a dream vacation, to make her feel the most joy she's felt for the earlier part of her life, and that the money is coming into your life while you sleep. Mm, You're connecting with their why. Getting to the heart of the issue, absolutely. So before we close, what else do you think would be helpful? Anything else that's kind of burning in your mind? Lots of things burning in my mind. Um, (laughs) Have you got, have you, have you, I'm assuming that you've kind of done it wrong and then gone back and, and retold your story or reconnected and. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I've, listen, uh, because I'm articulate, I run the risk of verbal vomit, and I've done a lot of that. I mean, when we first get into this game, I used to gush everything about the products and the ingredients and the incredible opportunity and the culture and blah, blah. And I never stopped to listen first and find out what that other person I was talking to was really looking for. Maybe they weren't looking for any of those things. So, yeah, it's a, and I'm still correcting and continuing as I go on. So what I would love to tell people is if you really want to get a handle on telling st- true stories in an engaging way, here's a book called Writing for Story. And the sub, I'm going to hold it up for you. Denise. Can you see that on camera? I sure can. Yeah. I'll and be getting it on Kindle. It says crap. Yep. Yeah, Craft Secrets. Craft Secrets of Dramatic Nonfiction by a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner. And what this guy will do is say, okay, if you're a journalist and you're just reporting true events, if you just tell the facts, people are not going to pay attention. You're going to put them to sleep. How do you tell those true things using all the techniques of dramatic storytelling to immediately grip people and make them pay instant attention. So I'll recommend that. And also, please, uh, for the listeners of Denise's show and certainly members of her team, what I've done is I've created a book, an ebook called Tell, Don't Sell, How to Become a Top Earning 
network marketer through the power of storytelling. It's, I think, about 34, 35 pages long. Denise has already read it. And I am soon going to put that together with other materials and turn it into a course. And at that point, it's going to cost big bucks. Right now, for a limited time, you guys can have the entire ebook absolutely free. Denise will post the link on the show notes page, and you just go there, um, put in your first name and email, and the book will be yours instantly. And I would love to hear your success stories when you start to implement those those techniques. And I'll bet you you're also going to start having a lot more fun prospecting. Absolutely. Thank you so much for referring us to the book and for creating that ebook and giving us access to it. I'll definitely put it in the show notes and in the description box on YouTube, wherever you're listening and definitely check it out because I did. I read through it. I took lots of notes and I started crafting my posts. I started crafting my messages in the way that I was speaking differently. And guess what? It works. When you connect to the audience in an emotional level, they'll be more inclined to say yes to whatever you are offering. Yeah. And to, to be open to you and, and knowing, liking, and trusting you. And without that, you have nothing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lewis, for your time today and sharing your expertise and wisdom. I have taken a page full of notes and I'm absolutely going to download uh, that writing for storybook because I think we can always be learning and growing in this area. So for those who are listening, take a look at your product, your business, and, and create a list of benefits. Benefits right? That the true benefit and then the benefit of the benefit and then work to craft your own story with beginning, middle and end and then practice it. This isn't something that just comes to you at, at, like on while you're sleeping, right? We have to actually work on it, develop it and get better at it. So Lewis, you have years and years of wisdom and experience and I'm just so grateful for your time today on the Dreamcast. Thank you so much. And as a final word, guys, watch more movies and ask yourself did the movie immediately engage me and if so why and if it didn't why didn't it and you will begin to learn some powerful things about storytelling Awesome. You can learn more about the power of story at Lewis's podcast website, changeyourstorypodcast.com. And you can download a free ebook on that site as well called Storytelling Secrets for the Rich Life and Business. So thank you again so much. And all of the links again will be in the show notes below and have an amazing afternoon. You too. And may your snow and my snow melt <laughs> yes. today. May it be spring. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. Have a great day, guys. Thank you so much for listening today. Head over to denisewalsh.com. Enter your email to subscribe to our list. And I'll be sending out an early bird special coupon. 50% off, in fact, of the Dream Life Workbook when it is launched in just a few months. So if you want to have first dibs, let's get your name on that list. Thanks again. I so appreciate you. And remember to dream big.